It's a big part of our mission, not only to become a home for artists, but also a home for culture and culture building. Another way in which we've been a home for culture is through our education program. We're training young kids of color to run our cultural institutions of tomorrow. The Apollo has helped me fully realize my love of the entertainment industry. This place has showed me that there's no limits to what I can do. Hello, and thank you for joining us for our community meetup series. I'm your host, Natalie Hernandez, Apollo Young producer and New York City journalist. The Apollo Young producers are a dynamic group of alumni from the Apollo's high school and college programs that curate a series of events for young people. The community meetup was created as a space to share our resources, find support, and discuss our experiences. Today, we're having an inspiring panel discussion of the pivotal role of young voices in affecting change in honor of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day and the National Day of Service. These young people who are just like you and me are putting in the work every day to make a change in their community. Edwin De Jesus is the youngest independent candidate to ever run for New York City Council. After receiving a full scholarship to Columbia University, this Astoria native and first generation graduate does not identify as a career politician. A Green Party candidate, he firmly believes in Medicare for all. He's also alum of the Apollo Theater Academy programs and has a background in film. Iman Abdul, born and raised in Brooklyn, is an artist, storyteller, organizer, and creative whose mission is to empower youth across New York City. She is a founding member of the youth-led nonprofit organization Integrate NYC and is currently doing research on a student on student identity development. Jeffrey Wall began, began his martial arts career at Roll On Martial Arts in Dayton, Ohio, when he was just six years old and was inducted into the USA Martial Arts Hall of Fame at just 10 years old. Earning his black belt in 2019, he started Golden Age Karate, a volunteer nonprofit organization that travels to nursing homes to provide compassion, care, and martial arts classes to seniors that otherwise may not get many visitors or attention. His classes are a huge hit among seniors and have been added to several senior living centers across the U.S. Thank you all for joining us today. Today's panel is all about service and helping our community. As the federal holiday that began as a way to honor Dr. King's birthday is now a day dedicated to encouraging and empowering people to participate in community service, Dr. King's life and work is an inspiration to many. Um, but today we'd like to hear from you about who or what inspires you to be of service to your community. Um. So my biggest inspirations, I would say, are my mom and my grandma, as well as the Young Wars Party, specifically my mom and my grandma. Um, they were both born and raised in Puerto Rico, and that's where I'm from, um, as well as my grandma didn't go to school past the fifth grade. Um, and so that was during the Americanization process that was happening in Puerto Rico. And that was a really, really difficult time where colonization was at its like peak. Um, and so you can just imagine what schooling was like and especially what that would be like for black and brown women on the island at that time. Um, and it's not that different now. Um, and so me going to college and me accomplishing um, and fighting for my, accomplishing what I've accomplished and fighting for my people as well as my island and where my ancestors come from. Um, that's what fuels me. That's what inspires me to continue doing what I'm doing. Um, as well as the Young Lords Party, who are young Puerto Rican and Latino youth from Chicago and New York City who fought for liberating black and brown people in our cities for help, for providing, um, like education and breakfast for your kids and just, you know, uplifting community overall, as well as fighting for the decolonization of our island. Um, 
it's kind of just like really inspiring to be from New York City um, and being a part of that diasporic upliftment. Edwin, would you like to share your experience and your inspirations with us? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that I was heavily inspired by Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, he's not perfect, no politician is. But what really drew me into his movement was the fact that it wasn't just about a particular candidate or a particular leader. It was about all of us coming together and putting perhaps aside our differences for a common goal. And with him, I believe he introduced me to Medicare for all, the idea that every single person should be guaranteed health care as a human right. America is one of the only countries, the only modern uh, industrialized country that doesn't guarantee health care to all of its citizens. You have 90 million Americans who are either uninsured or underinsured. And it was Senator Sanders who was really leading the fight to make sure that everyone could get the help that they deserve. And I think that very much resembles the words of Dr. King, who himself has said that out of all of the forms of injustice, uh, ones that violate uh, health, seem to be the most inhumane. And I very much agree with that, that as a, as a society, we cannot progress forward unless everyone is healthy as a basic human right. Wow, that's super powerful. I feel like my biggest inspiration is my parents, definitely. And for the martial arts aspect, I would say Michael J. White, because he was one of the first African-American Af martial artists to go public. And I was just like to see someone who looks like me on TV was just a huge inspiration. And my parents always taught me that kindness could get you anywhere in life that you want to go. Thank you all for sharing your inspiration with us. I feel like they're all interconnected and the people who inspire us really um, allow us to put in the work that we want to see in terms of change in our community. You're all very accomplished young people, and I know that your inspirations really help to keep you moving. Um, and we're going to find out a little bit about your individual journeys tonight as the program goes on. But I'd love to know, what does it feel like when you're inspired? Or how does it feel to be an inspiration to others? Honestly, growing up, seeing all these stars on TV and looking at them having the aspirations to be in their shoes one day, and now that moment being here, like at just the age of 16, and knowing, knowing that people look up to me is just like a crazy feeling that I never would have thought of. Not necessarily like being starstruck over these people, but like it was crazy when I met one, like a star, like it was like felt just, I don't even know how to explain it, but now that people are looking at me and then they could see me possibly and be like, oh, look, it's Jeff. And I'm just like, well, I don't know you, but you want to take pictures. I'm, I'm with it. <laughs> so like just that feeling and it just brings joy to my heart that I know I'm inspiring other people as well. Jeff, I wish I was as cool as you when I was 16. Um, being an inspiration to others sometimes is pretty like, I don't know. I, I never even know how to feel because I'm like, is this, am I really like inspiring people? Like I often self doubt myself in like a lot of the things that I do. I'm like, I'm doing this because it's necessary. Um, and if I inspire, I inspire. Um, but I feel like my main goal is to just like be represented of like a representation. Um, and so I guess like just by doing what I do and holding the many identities that I hold, um, it's like really, it's really neat to see people from my community um, be inspired and, and send me messages or like see me on the street randomly and they're like, oh my God, I follow you or my friend follows you. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, it's like really funny um, because New York City is such a, it's such a big city, but a really small community as well. So um I just love building community and I think like that's the most important part for me because it's just about like building that network so that we can all help each other and all be able to work together in some way, shape or form because we are all we have. And so, yeah, being an inspiration and being inspired, it, it, it works in a circle. I think it's a pretty big responsibility when people look up to you um, as somebody who ran for office, there's a, a conflict that occurs, which is if you want to be a successful politician, 
you have to say things that appeal to the most amount of people and say things that are popular. But sometimes saying things that are true and putting value in integrity and authenticity can sometimes be unpopular. And sometimes telling the truth can make people uncomfortable. And so sometimes you'd have to reconcile, well, how can I say something that I believe is true without alienating all of these people who are looking up to you and investing themselves in your campaign without basically tanking it? So for example, uh, both parties, Democrat, Republican, take a lot of special interest money and they take money from Wall Street, from the fossil fuel industry, from private health insurance companies. When you call out uh, these injustices and bring attention to them, sometimes it turns off people who very much don't want to be uh, holding their own accountable. But I think it's very important that we do hold our own accountable, especially our own elected leaders, because if you're a parent, you're going to be more strict with your own child than the children of others. And so some people might take it the wrong way if you're critical of the leaders that you actually support, as opposed to just um, always turning a blind eye to when they are wrong. And that goes for myself as well. I think everyone is hitting very interesting points like accountability, community, um, you know, networking in those communities is so important when you are being an inspiration to people because it's a responsibility you hold. Um, and it's honestly very heroic. Edwin, I wanna start with you. Um, running for New York City Council, you've had to deal with people whose views differ extremely from your platform. Um, you've even had your mic snatched during rallies. We have some video of that. Um, let's take a look. They called for zero emissions by 2030. The Democrats are calling for 50% emissions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't put your hands on The Democratic Party is not progressive. You can't shoot horny corporate bodies. Wow, Edwin, that was really um, powerful. You were exercising your freedom of speech, and uh, we just saw at the end of that, um, you said you were challenging the status quo. When you relive that moment watching the clip, how do you feel? Well, I always cringe a little bit watching it because, you know, that's not necessarily, I think, the most um, calm and presentable state that I can be in. There's a lot of anger that is involved there. Uh, but just to provide a little bit of context, that uh, protest that m myself and some other housing activists essentially counter protested was organized by the DSA, of which I am a member. And I do vote and I have voted for many of the of the elected officials that I was calling out in that video, not from a right wing point of view, but from more of a left wing critique. And so the reason that I'm specifically going after them in that video is because NYCHA, which is New York City's public housing authority, the largest in the country, is currently under threat of being privatized which could lead to mass eviction in the very near future. The blueprint plan, as I've said in the video, it was begun by the de Blasio administration and will be continued by the Adams administration. And it will displace a lot of the people living in public housing. And so I thought that the members of the DSA who tend to lean much more progressive on a lot of these issues have yet to come out in, in, in rejection of this blueprint plan. And we've been trying to get them to say that they would vote no, and we haven't. And that's because at the end of the day, even if you are someone who doesn't take money from the big real estate developers, the party at large, and obviously New York City is mostly run by the Democratic Party, but Republicans as well, obviously, the party at large is what sets the direction for everyone else. So if you as a candidate might have a contradicting view 
it's going to hurt you in, in terms of how much leverage you have. So these politicians, they're capitulating to the establishment so that they don't break their own relationships at the expense of working people, of low income people. And so I was there with housing activists to say, hey, we need to protect what is known as Section 9 housing, which is the one that cannot be privatized. They want to eliminate that. And so I think it was very important to speak up, even if it was against an organization that I'm part of. Um, and, you know, obviously they tried to silence me. Um, and look, you know, I get it. It's, it's rare for people to call out members of their own tribe, per se. But I think that's what needs to be done. Because, you know, if it was just hate, I wouldn't be there trying to make them take better positions. I would be there to, you know, tell them that, you know, if it was, it, it's, it's more of something like, let's hold you accountable so that we can push you in the direction of, uh, you know, the reason we put you in office. And so DSA stands for Democratic Socialists of America. Um, but in some ways, I've seen a lot of their policies mirror a lot of what we see the corporate Democratic, uh, the corporate wing of the Democratic Party support. And it's 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 whatever is going to help working people at the end of the day. It's not about reputation. It's not about climbing the political career ladder. It's simply what is going to help working class people the most. And in that instance, I feel like what needed to be said had been said. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, um, and thank you for educating us about DSA and about a bunch of issues that are happening in New York City. Um, one thing I do want to ask you is, you know, when you are challenging the status quo and some people are hesitant to, you know, challenge people that they might be voting for or might be working with um, when they're making change. When you feel like they're trying to silence you, what does that mean to you in our democratic world and how do you deal with it? Well, you know, I am a big believer in the First Amendment. I know that censorship is something that we have been seeing increasingly online and social media platforms on college campuses. You know, again, I was a staffer for the Bernie campaign. You know, part of my job was organizing rallies and town halls for Senator Sanders. Uh, my first rally was actually at um, Morehouse College, uh, where Dr. King actually went to school. Um, I, I led the motorcade in South Carolina for Bernie. I was in the front car. Bernie was behind us leading the way, you know, pretty much the, the dream of any, of any person who wants to be involved in progressive politics. Uh, but once things started to change during the pandemic and onwards, where the party has been moving continually in the direction of the right, and if you look at a lot of these electeds uh, on Twitter, they've stopped saying Medicare for all. It's actually not part of their platform any longer. In fact, President Biden said he would veto Medicare for all, which is something that we desperately need. Um, and so, you know, it's not beneficial to me to be coming out and saying this because so many people that I've met through Bernie world will feel alienated when I'm saying these things. But it doesn't mean that I'm a Republican. It just means that I want to see uh the supposed party of the working class actually in the direction of the working class. But there's too many systemic factors at play, too much greed and power and too many large corporations who are actually calling the shots, who are actually telling the, the politicians what they should and shouldn't believe in. And since they are going to be listening to the large corporations instead of us, I feel that it's almost counterproductive to be going down this route that I feel is a dead end, which is trying to make incrementalist reform. Um, I believe it was MLK who said, I'm blanking on the exact quote, but it's it's really a sense of urgency. You know, if we don't do this now, when are we ever going to do it? Yeah. So it's basically about MLK says, you know, there, 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 we're always being told that we have to wait for a more convenient season, that we have to wait until the next administration, or we just have to keep putting more progressives into office. But people are dying by the thousands. And the longer that we wait trying to do traditional forms of organizing, the more people will continue to suffer. And so it's important that we take strategies that might be unpopular 
in order to get the material change that we need for the working class. Iman, what do you think led you to the path you're on right now? I would say definitely my identities, my intersectional identities, and being a product of New York City's public schools, for sure. Um, I got here because I am a product of New York City's public schools. My mom didn't want to put me in the elementary school that was right down the block from me uh, growing up because that was not the good school. Um, and that's when I, my mom had to drive me to school about 25 minutes away every day um, to be in a gifted and talented program in a public school. And gifted and talented program didn't have students that looked like me um, and didn't have students that were darker than me. <laughs> and um, it was really, really harmful because I didn't see students that reflected my identities. I didn't see teachers that reflected my identities um, in my classes. But when I would look at the regular classes that were not gifted and talented, those classes had the students that reflected my, my identities. Um, and that was really alarming to me at a very young age where I've always felt the struggle of fitting in. Um, and in the third grade, I put on the hijab and I wore the hijab. I was about eight, nine years old until I was about 13, 14 in middle school. So like after eighth grade is when I took it off. And so I went through all those years um, wearing the hijab and it still wasn't too long after 9-11. Um, this was around 2000. Um, and so kids in school would ask me if I was related to Osama bin Laden, would ask if my uh, family were terrorists or came from terrorists in the Middle East. Um, they would ask me a bunch of a bunch of harmful things like what does Allahu Akbar mean and like a whole bunch of things that were extremely harmful and made me even want to stray away farther from um, my Arab identity and from my Muslim faith as well, my Islamic faith. And so I definitely felt pressured to take it off um, and it didn't reflect me in so many ways, the hijab. And so I was like, okay, I have to start fresh. Um, I'm going to a new high school. Um, and I didn't say this, but my middle school was a predominantly black and brown middle school. And so I went to two predominantly white elementary schools and then I went to one predominantly black and brown middle school and then I went to a predominantly white high school um which is which was a screen school um and many people don't know this but New York City's high school enrollment policies um are pretty open in terms of where you want to go to school you can apply to any school in any borough in the entire city um and so I, my mom had me apply to this screened school in South Brooklyn. Um, and again, a screened school has limitations because you had to have certain grades for um, certain math and sciences. You had to have certain extracurriculars. It's basically like a little resume as if this is college, but I'm in the eighth grade, right? Or like my entire life before that, I'm preparing for this high school resume and now for this college resume. Integration is not just putting black and white bodies in a space and then expecting that to work out and calling that integration. Like it's actually the transformation of minds and the transformation of, of connections and the relationships that we build in these settings. What is the curriculum reflecting? Is it reflecting the identities of black and brown people? Is it being taught by black and brown people? Um, is, the, is the administration in the school representative of the identities um, of the students of New York City? Because clearly my predominantly white high school is not is not a representation of the full New York City. Actually, out of 1.2 million students, 73% of students identify as students of color. Wow. And out of those 73, probably over 50% of them identify as Black and Latinx. So that's not reflected in our curriculum. It's not reflected in our teachers. New York City 
uh, teachers are over 54% of them identify as white. And now that's all at fault of the Department of Education. And um, then we wonder, like, why is racism progressing? Why are all of these isms, sexism, homophobia, um, all, why are all these things progressing? Because we're literally not having educators. We're not having safe spaces. We're having the school to prison pipeline continue to be a cycle continuing putting black and brown students into jail. And that's why New York City has over 5,000 NYPD in our schools and less than 3,000 guidance counselors and social workers in our schools. And that speaks volumes about the educational system that we go through in New York City. And if young people are not talking about this, then like, why are we not at the center of the conversation if this is affecting us directly? Like, yes, parents are affected. Yes, teachers are affected. Yes, principals and admin are affected. But y'all are having this conversation by yourselves. And students are almost, are not almost, students are never a part of that conversation. And so it's kind of how I got into what I was doing. Um, and I met with a teacher in the, in the South Bronx at the time. Her name is Sarah Camisholi. Um, and she invited me to help start integrate NYC um, and form it into a nonprofit organization. And so that's where we are now. I don't work with them anymore, um, but my work is forever <laughs> embedded in, in our organization and what we carry. And I carry it with me in everything I do as well. Your journey has led you to a colorful and impactful and inspiring path. Um, and we would love to see some of your work. that we saw you dedicated your campaigns to a representation and a, a big number of of your intersecting identities and a number of intersecting identities that people can relate to um can you tell us a little bit about how these campaigns came to be and what they mean to you yes um so i guess i'll start with my uh nike campaign so my Save NYC Nike by You campaign was, I believe, in 2019, the summer of 2019. Um, I was 21 at the time. I love sneakers, being born and raised in New York, well, in Brooklyn. I love sneakers, sneaker culture, Jordans, Nikes, um, and so... And I love fashion. And so when I was a senior in high school, my first job ever was working at um, the Soho flagship store for Adidas. And that's kind of how like I wanted to like put myself in the game. Um, and then I just got constantly inspired by fashion and the sneaker wear industry. And so I was like, I really would love to like storytell and share black and brown stories through sneaker design. And I remember like speaking that out loud and I've, cause I've never spoken out loud before that. And then a day or two after I saw an ad on my Instagram that said like, Hey, like Nike is collecting applications to like, uh, tell your story on an Air Max. And I was like, um, and then I was like, okay, well I'm going to apply because the worst to come is that it's, it's fake. Like it's not real. And then a month passed and I got the opportunity and it was an official Nike email that said congratulations like you've been selected to tell your story on an Air Max 200 um, and like gave me the details for the entire like rollout and stuff. And so that's kind of how I got like that experience. Um, and so I told my sneaker, my sneaker is called Save NYC and I highlighted seven different issues that were that are that were and are extremely pressing to me. Um, and so specifically highlighting public school segregation, hi highlighting immigration reform, highlighting gentrification in Brooklyn and throughout New York City, highlighting how black and brown youth lead uh, movements and the forefront to change, but also support from the back and the ground up. I highlight climate change um, and I highlight 
Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Rican rights and the decolonization of Puerto Rico, as well as women's empowerment. And I know that sounds like a lot, but like that's everything that was highlighted on that shoe. Um, and so that's how I got involved and it sold on Nike.com. Um, and yeah, and then after that, it was, a, it was a really dope opportunity that brought me into Converse. And so I had a friend that uh, was the vice president of Harvard University, and she was invited by Converse to help um, design the Converse All Star program. And um, and if people don't know, the Converse All Star program is a program of over three thousand artists and creatives across the world um, that just expand themselves to connect with community and uplift community through the arts. Um, and so she needed to build a team um, and she saw my Nike portfolio and my Nike sneaker and then she called me and invited me to Converse headquarters to be a part of this brainstorming process for Converse All-Stars and so it's been really and it's been a really empowering process um, and so I, I'm a co- uh, a co-designer of the all-star program and then being now a part of the all-star program I'm involved in different things and working with projects um, with Converse all-stars across the country and across the world I'm currently working on one um, with a fellow Converse all-star in Australia um, and then I was invited to shoot for their recent um, or their current their current campaign that's out right now. I just hope to make my community proud and for other young women and other young people that reflect my identities to see themselves in me because that's really what it's about. That is so amazing and you should be so proud of yourself. Um, you've gone on a long journey um, and you've been incorporating your causes that you advocate for in these campaigns. That is so awesome um and using these major brands as a platform for your activism is super super admirable so one thing iman spoke about was intersecting identities um and influence influencing um passions for activism jeff um what keeps your passions for the causes that you're passionate about going Honestly, what keeps me passionate is seeing my mother and parents proud of me and also seeing my seniors reach new heights that I never could expect that they have made it to. Like, for example, with my seniors, one of my seniors was like doing push ups, like going all the way down. And I wasn't really expecting it because she's like one of the seniors, but she looks about 50 to like late 60s or early 60s. But I got up after congratulating her for doing the push-ups correctly too, not at that, but I asked her how old she was, if she didn't mind me asking. And when she said she was 95 years old and I was like, you only taking one class and you're 95 doing push-ups, going all the way down, doing correctly. That just shows like a little bit of an impact that I had in just one class. Cause that was the second class that I had with that same student. And another example is after my, before my student, one of my students in my other nursing home, was taking martial arts classes with me. She was on four pills for diabetes. And after she only needed one because she became more active. And just knowing that I am inspiring other people, just like my my seniors and that they're sharing the wisdom with me is just like an amazing experience. When it comes to filmmaking, what keeps my passion going is the ability to make people come together and feel entertained specifically with comedy. I love shooting films that make people laugh because it kind of creates an escape from the suffering of the real world. When it comes to activism, it's a similar thing. There's so much suffering and the root causes of those suffering are delusion, ill will, and greed. And as long as those still exist and as long as people are still uh, not liberated from these, uh, these sources of suffering, there's always going to be a need to keep pushing and making progress. And in terms of you know, some of the actions that I've organized, the New York City March for Medicare for All, that was something where we had over 300 people come out in support of that march. Uh, we had Susan Sarandon was our keynote speaker, um, Christian Smalls, the Amazon whistleblower, who's uh, trying to unionize the Amazon workers 
in the Staten Island warehouse. We're still working together. It's these kinds of relationships that I feel are imperative to bringing people together, people who might have ideological differences, but who can set aside those differences for a common goal, whether it be rights for laborers, whether it be uh, universal health care. And to know that I'm in some way, shape or form uh, in charge of this or leading a protest or organizing these types of actions feels like in itself an obligation that if I have these resources at my disposal, I have to keep using them. Otherwise, really, what's the point in, 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 in being so uh, privileged to have, know these people if we're not coming together and making change happen? Jeff, your family has been very influential in your life, specifically your grandparents. Um, we have some pictures and video of them. Why don't we all take a look at your beautiful family? It's super inspiring, and we've been talking about community and inspiration. Um, but it can be said that the spirit of service starts at home. And that leads me to you, Jeff. Um, Jeff, you really embody that through the story um, of how Golden Age Karate came to be, what you know service means. Um, can you share a little bit with us about how you started your nonprofit? Yes, I will have to take it back, like before I even started martial arts, honestly. Well, my mom's a nurse, so she's always used to helping people. And my dad used to own a store, so he's also used to helping people a lot. And then before that, my or after that, my sister, she started her own nonprofit first. And that was when I was five years old and she was 10 years old. And then being around her just really inspired me before I even understand what inspiring, what getting inspired was to be around people and help people in any way I could. My sister, she was just 10 years old when she started hers and it's called Polish Girls and she travels to nursing home or uh, hospitals and paints girls nails with special needs. And I always used to be around at the time. And then about five years later when I was 10 and was able to comprehend like what special needs was and was the need to help out people was. And I used to help around a little bit with her and she would let me like do all the heavy lifting because I was still big for a 10 year old. So I could do that. But I wasn't really allowed in any of the hospitals because or in the, the patient's room because of my age. So that always like inspired me. Like to, uh, when I get older, I want to help do something. And I was getting martial arts training and I was like, what can I do to help push out and spread the message? And I got my black belt. And I was like, I think this is my time to spread the word. And I thought who would need the love and attention and care and also need for martial arts. And I thought of senior citizens because my grandmother, she lives alone and she's been dragging. And I, whenever I come over there, she just lightens up. And I thought other seniors would possibly feel the same way. So I started Golden Age Karate and I traveled to the first nursing home and had a director come in and she she loved the idea and she didn't even come to the first class. That's how confident she was in me. I was a little bit nervous at the time, but I got over it and it just took off from there. Now let's have a little fun with each other. Let's see how quickly we can think of these answers to these questions together. It's gonna to be like a speed round of questions and we wanna hear your calls to action for young people. Always break the rules. If there's a job application and it says college students only and you're a high school senior, apply anyway, because you never know, you might still get an interview and it happens. And if there's ever um, a job that you're looking for, seek a mentor, write an email to a hundred different people in the industry that you wanna join 
and maybe one will actually respond and that one mentor can be enough to actually get you the experience you need to move forward. I would say um, to tap into yourself and to tap into your power. Um, because when if you are 100% sure of who you are and you know where you come from, you know what you stand by and you know who stands behind you, you would feel like truly indestructible and that you could conquer anything because your ancestors have given you that power and you are their wildest dreams. Yeah, it's definitely all about, you know, the rooms that you're in and who you're connecting with. And, you know, we're all connecting today and that that's super powerful that you guys are using your voices to um, really speak to the communities that you're a part of. My question for you is, being young people and who are doing advocacy, you obviously feel a responsibility to the generations, you know, after you. Um, how do you keep that momentum going and how do you hope to inspire young people? For me, it's being that representation um, in all of the ways, whether it's being um, active, being creative, being showing it through education is just showing all of the multifaceted ways that us as young people can inspire and push a movement and um hopefully that's like enough to inspire um the future generation you're the youngest on this panel um how does that feel and how do you hope to inspire those younger than you um i hope to inspire the people that are younger than me to show that you are never too young to in influence other people. You say you, you could be 10 years old and you could still have an impact on somebody else that is much older than you or much younger than you. So just keep following your passion and never let anybody distract you or from your goal that you're trying to get to. And just because someone is your peer does not mean that you cannot listen to them or gain some type of knowledge from them. Even some of my old seniors, they say that they gain so much knowledge from me just talking to them alone and it's just stay stay on your grind. <laughs> Don't let any distractions happen. I would say that the past year and a half has been probably the most rough on the youth of today in terms of mental health. And I just wanna say that if you keep pushing, we'll make it through. And you always have to believe in yourself. Don't wait for a bandwagon to begin to jump on it. You start the bandwagon. Don't feel afraid that you need to ask for permission you don't need to ask any institution or any uh, organized group for permission to do anything. You can do it on your own and you can have people inspired by you so that if you pay it forward, eventually one day you will receive everything that you give. And it's, it's a cycle of good karma. And uh, I would recommend that when you are able to vote, that you vote your conscious because we know that the youngest generations are the most likely to actually vote for the candidate that they want, whether it be a third party or not, uh, because it is the youngest generations who realize that the lesser of two evils illusion is just that, an illusion. So we've all heard some snippets of everyone's story, um, and you've all been very generous in sharing parts of your story with each other. How do you guys connect with each other? What resonates? Honestly, I have two questions for Edwin here. And my first question is, how did your family support your activism and like the trials and tribulations that's gone through with the activism and your speeches? And they were really powerful and really connected with me. How did those, how did your family react to that? Yeah, um, my mom's definitely my biggest supporter. Um, you know, she's really good at talking with people. Uh, you know, she's just... Like she works in a warehouse, you know, paycheck to paycheck, uh, very ordinary lifestyle. Um, and I think that being able to go out during a time where everybody seems so isolated and standoffish from kind of meeting new people, she kind of seemed to be like a glow for a lot of people because she's just generally very social. And uh, if there were ever some sort of event that I would attend and, and she would tag along, she would always be like talking it up and the life of the party always. And so I definitely feel like 
she was actually more of an inspiration to me going forward. And I got to see a side of her that I don't normally get to see, which is her like in action outside of her normal office job, which is something that helped us kind of grow together and learn more about each other. So um, it definitely helped enhance my own uh, sense of, of family relationship. And my second question is, when you're in like a crowd or a group of people and everyone seems like they're against you, what motivates you to keep going and keep sharing your point and your perspective? Yeah, um, I think that even though there's always disagreements that arise in politics, people will always value your honesty. So if you just tell it like it is, um, even if it is something that people disagree with, people will see that you're being honest. And, and most of the time they'll say, I will set aside our differences and we can still be allies because, you know, you know you're not um, fooling me. I'm not fooling you. We're both being who we are authentically. And at the end of the day, I think that's really how coalitions are built. If you have too many uh, purity tests and say, well, we want to build a movement, but if you, uh, you know, don't necessarily align with my interest on X, Y, and Z, then you're out. There would be no labor unions. There would be no fights against the establishment. There would be no um, negotiations to give more of these workers uh, safer working conditions and higher wages. Um, they ha there's no other choice but to come together because realistically, there are way more of us than there are um, ultra wealthy individuals who get to call all of the shots in this world. So we can come together in our quantity, um, then there's definitely a lot of us um, even if it doesn't seem so on the surface, people might not like a post that you make, but they'll DM you privately and say, I really like what you said there. And that's what will always keep me motivated to keep just speaking my mind freely, even if surface level, it doesn't seem like it's something that everyone can come together on. I think one thing as young people, we all use a lot is social media. Um, how do you guys use social media to kind of educate yourself, educate other people? Why don't you share that with me? I can start. Um, so I, I did about three years ago a little social media cleanse where I realized, like, I can't just be following the same people from high school, the same people from my neighborhood, the this, this same little circle of people that don't share the same motives that I have um, or ambitions that I have. And I'm like, okay, I need to follow people that do things that I wanna do. If I wanna become a creative director, what black and brown female, female creative directors are in my area or are in the country or are or are rep or represent my identity um and like following different people that fuel my creativity fuel my knowledge um i like started following so many puerto rican activist pages and historical pages um to like continue supporting these organizations um and these small groups across the country and even on the island but um as well as to educate myself and just gather more information. I think just really cleansing your social media and having it reflect things that are really relevant to you and um, empowering to you. I think that's a huge, a huge, huge factor in social media and how it can be extremely impactful. Um, and then sharing and using your, your social media as a platform to call out on situations of injustice to connect with other people i can say that especially during the pandemic social media was like really at its peak for sharing information for sharing on the ground footage of protesting and what has been going on um on the streets and social media it has been a huge huge powerful tool um, and so it's really about how we are using it to build these connections and to create change um, and meaningful change. And so I've met so many people through Instagram over the pandemic that now the pandemic is not over, but, you know, it's slowing down. People want to say it's speeding up, but it's slowing down in, in my world. <laughs> so, so I've been able to meet more people um, that I haven't been able to meet like in 2019 or in 2020. Um, and so, yeah, I think social media has like really bridged people from across to create really meaningful connections and impactful um, decisions. And yeah, just use it for that and make sure it reflects you. 
I feel like you should surround yourself or follow people who have like the same dreams and ambitions as you, because if you're just seeing a bunch of people who are just talking about a bunch of nonsense, that's going to make you think, oh, maybe that's how the right way you should go. Or, oh, that's really helping them. So maybe it'll help me too. But no, that's not the, always the case because you can have your own thoughts and your own interactions that will allow you to be better as a person and grow as a person. And it won't be the same as what somebody else's dreams or aspirations are. So if you're just following your dream and sticking to your heart and you will be in the right path. I would say my experience with social media is a little different. I like to follow accounts that completely disagree with me so that I could kind of get into the bubble of what people across the ideological spectrum have to think so that if I can really get into the mentality of, of, of other people, that when we have our conversations, I can already have my points laid out so that if we have a debate, we can, we can already anticipate the counter argument and that we can kind of see where people's perspective lies in crafting our arguments. Cause there's always different ways that you can shape what you have to say to meet a specific audience. And one of the things that I love about Instagram is that you can put out polls. And so I was always putting out polls about controversial subjects to see what people think. And surprisingly, I would get a lot of results and, uh, you know, people can see, you know, if they vote who voted for the other thing. And I hope that people can see like, whoa, I didn't know that Obviously, it's not the most accurate because it's people who are following you. It's, so it's not really a super random sample of people. But since a lot of the people in my circle are from this community in Queens, it kind of gives other people an opportunity to see what others are thinking about in their same community so that we can kind of grow from, uh, you know, being in our, uh, in our, in our enclosed uh, uh, thought bubbles and opening and, and learning more from others. Absolutely. And I think we're all learning from each other. And with social media, we can all stay connected. You all have different lanes of almost advocacy and community service and aiding the communities that you're a part of. What are your calls to action for the causes that you care about? I have an overall cause call to action and it's very generic but I feel like it can apply to anybody um and it's and it's a quote from Desmond Tutu um where he says that if you are silent or neutral in situations of injustice you have chosen the side of the oppressor um and that's my favorite quote I feel like anybody can apply it in any way, shape, or form needed to their lives. But if you see something that it is not right or something is unjust, do something. Because if you don't speak up about it, if you don't, and like if you don't speak up about it, if you don't draw about it, if you don't sing about it, if you don't perform about it, if you don't educate about it, there's so many different ways to spread knowledge and to spread. And, and to speak up against injustices, right? It's not only protesting on the streets, which a lot of people um, are used to. So there's so many different forms of taking advocacy. Take advocacy, because when you don't, you are actively choosing the side of the oppressor and you are watching our people being harmed and being in, in literally just, just being harmed. And so speak up, use your voice, in any extent, because you are the power. Kind of to piggyback off of what Iman said, you should always spread your message, no matter how other people view your opinion, because if you don't speak out about it, then it would never get done or change would never happen. So you just always stick to your gut and stick to your, your instincts and never feel like what somebody says to you, you should always change because the change might not always be for the better. They could always have wrong intentions for you. Um, I would say it, it's important to just sometimes let go. And what I mean by that is to detach yourself from everything that you think constitutes yourself. Everything that is external outside of you that you believe makes up your self identity, let go of it. Once you can let go of your attachments is when you can really understand that there is no separation between you and your worst enemy because we're all two sides of the same coin. We're all connected. And in this universe, everyone, even those who might appear to be uh, opposed to us or 
against us. Um, in many ways, we are all very, very similar. Uh, I could say that there's probably 90% of things we all agree upon, but the 10% of disagreements we have are what is always blown out of proportion in the public dialogue, in the media. Don't let those minor differences distract us from the fact that we're all human beings of the same human race and that don't ever let economics or the drive to profit distract you from the fact that humans are innately altruistic beings and that by letting go, we can kind of come to that conclusion ourselves and hopefully inspire others to do the same. Do you have any steps or suggestions for young people to actually be of service? Like what kind of actions can we take to be of service to our community? And then do you have any parting words of advice? I was going to say that um, a lot of times people underestimate um, how powerful change at home is. And so I feel like when like having conversations with your family members, um, with your parents and your family members, aunts, uncles, because a lot of them um, hold many thoughts and ideas that do not align with <laughs> with necessarily yours and what we are fighting for in today's progressive world. Um, and so change starts at home. Have those hard conversations with your friends, with your loved ones, because if you're not changing the people that are in your circle, then it's 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 gonna be even harder to reach the people that are outside of your circle. And so change starts from within. And parting words of advice would be to love yourself. It's really hard out here. We doubt ourselves a lot. We doubt our creativity. We doubt all of, of everything that we hold. And so you're, you're, you're beautiful and you're loved and just love yourself remind yourself i'm reminding you <laughs> some of the first steps that you could take is you got to start by building your confidence because it's going to take a lot of courage for you to be able to influence others and if you're like shaking whenever you're talking to somebody or acting nervous you got to learn how to like overcome those facts or factors until you can be able to just speak and know what you're talking about because you can't change somebody's opinion if you're not really sure about your own so some parting ways advice that I have is just take risk. Like you never know the outcome of those risks. You could always, it could always be bad, but you never look at it that like that. You always have a positive attitude and just be yourself. And if you're goofy, be goofy. If you're happy, be happy. Just <laughs> and love everybody, treat everybody equally, have respect, simple things. Um, Knowing that failure is inevitable and that you can always expect to fail and it's not necessarily a bad thing to fail, but it's always an opportunity to learn a lesson from failure. And even if you are in your earliest stages and it seems like there's only one or two people who are listening to you, that's actually a lot. And the more that you um, keep putting the same message out and continue to fall, but as long as you keep getting back up, people will notice, you yourself will take notice, and then every time a failure happens, it's easier to brush it off instead of lingering on it and accepting it and moving forward. Um, so a parting piece of advice I would give is never look at you know I, uh, these influencers on Instagram and they have millions of followers and their life looks perfect. Nobody's life is perfect. What you see on social media is a constructed image of most people's lives that basically take the happiest moments and piece that together, leaving out all the sad moments. Understand that everybody goes through problems. Um, everybody goes through uh, hardships and obstacles so that don't ever compare yourself to an expectation that's unrealistic or doesn't exist. Don't compare yourself to an illusion. So thank you all for being so candid with me and 
you're all right. You all gave some really hard hitting points. We need to be ourselves. We need to accept and give ourselves grace when we fail. And we need to just have respect for others when we're trying to make change. Um, thank you for all the work that you are doing to benefit the world and really make it a better place. I mean, there's so many things going on in this world and that happened in 2020 and 2021 and maybe in 2022. But you guys are all putting in work to make our world better on massive scales and on smaller scales. Um, so on behalf of the Apollo Theater and the Young Producers Club, we thank you. Um, thank you for being part of our panel. You all had wonderful things to share and thank you for a wonderful conversation today.